Okay, you're on. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Carl Schuster, and we're in the second of our four-part series on the uh, young artists of Tanglewood and beyond. And um, before we get into the main part of the program, I just wanted to remind you that you can use the chat function to submit questions, and we will have a question and answer period following Samantha Bennett's uh, presentation. So um, I wanted to take out some, maybe five minutes or so to go over with you one of the frequently asked questions about our home concerts that I think might be of interest to you. Um, it, it is, the question is, where do we get our featured artists from? How do we find people to perform in our home and do we vet them? And I can tell you that the question about vetting people solves itself because since the source of so many of our young artists uh, is the uh, Tanglewood Music Center program, um, they are already vetted because if they can get into that program, you know they're very fine uh, instrumentalists. And um, um, if we see that they've gone to New England Conservatory and they're coming out of Juilliard or Curtis or Indiana University or Rice, we know they're really fine players and we don't have to really do anything more than that. So then it goes to the second question, how do we find our featured artists? Well, originally Claudia and I used to get to know some of the young players at, at the TMC because of the host program. But when that program folded, we started to do the lunch program uh, behind Ozawa Hall, at which time we would get to know the young players uh, at lunchtime uh, every Wednesday. And then as the season went on, we kind of got a feel for which of the players might enjoy coming back during the winter months and play for us. So that was a very rich vein. And uh, we're, we're still hosting some of the folks who we met in that way. Um, also, Claudia, as some of you know, is an artist and does sketches. So we are known to sit in the first 10 rows at Ozawa Hall. Claudia would sketch particularly the young players from TMC and then run after them afterwards and give them the sketches and she kind of got very well known for doing that. So that was another way in which we would get to know the players. Um, that we also have had BSO affiliated artists who have come and played. So I'm thinking primarily of folks like uh, Norman Fisher and his wife Jean. He's a cellist as you know and, and she's a pianist. And one time they wanted to have a run through before they did a program um, two weeks hence in Seattle, I think it was. And they asked whether they could come and play in our home for a group. So we did that, of course, that was just absolutely wonderful. And then we have a lot of uh, local folks who we've gotten to know through miscellaneous experiences with music in the area. Uh, Armand Dinelli and the great jazz pianist who's out of Hudson, New York and played at Castle Street for years. Um, George Schuler also played at Castle Street. The Schuler um, trio, Armin played um, with George and George did a presentation in our home uh, with slides and, and um, uh, film and so forth about the music in in those days when he was um, a youngster kind of running around Tanglewood and the music in and uh, he has a wonderful collection of memorabilia and that was just an extraordinary program. Um, Richard Mickey is a, a cellist with the um, Springfield Symphony and also plays during the winter months uh, in Williamstown with the uh, Berkshire Symphony. Um, uh, Paul Green, many of you know the clarinetist Paul Green for his jazz as well as his classical music and, uh, and also his klezmer, another fine instrumentalist based here in the Berkshires. Um, in one, one occasion, we, um, through our son Todd, who knew uh, Brian Zeger at the Juilliard School, um, we got to, we were introduced to Peter Dugan, who will be on our, on this program next Sunday, and his wife, Kara, who um, both uh, were students at Juilliard then, and of course, their careers have just taken off since then. So they performed in our home probably four times or so. Um, we've gotten to know some composers, Eric Nathan, who has been commissioned by the Boston Symphony and was the composer in residence at um, Williams College and used to come to our concerts here. So we have followed his career and he has done, written some compositions for a, a piano trio, one of which was 
um, premiered here in our, actually in our home about a year ago. Um, Richard Pancheff, who's from London, England, who's a composer, uh, does a lot of choral music and church music, met him at Tanglewood at a reception, and he is in the process of writing a composition that was supposed to be performed this October, which will feature Ben Luxon as narrator, and um, uh, I'm sure her name is uh, slipping away, but she's the violinist um, with, the, uh, with the Knights. And um, so that we're uh, looking forward to that. Um, and as far as contemporary music, we were a little fearful when we first started down the route of the contemporary music as to whether our folks would all enjoy it or not. Um, but we have had the likes of Ashley Bathgate, the cellist, who will close out our four-part series in two weeks. Um, also, Nadia Sirota, who is, who some of you know, has had, has had a long time program on WQXR and um, uh, has a series called Beat the Composer that was absolutely fabulous. She's very well known in contemporary music circles. And the uh, ACME, the American Contemporary Music Ensemble, while it didn't literally begin in our home, it was a bunch of uh, TMCers who put that together and they're still playing today. And they're one of the foremost contemporary music uh, ensembles around. So we've done all of those things and, and found players from all of those different sor sources. Um, we uh, first got to know Samantha um, when she was at um, playing in Ozawa Hall. And then she, I think she, Samantha, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were there for three years. And the last year was the, the, the New From Players. So she was playing a lot of contemporary music even then, and which has morphed over to her, the series that she has in the Sarasota area. Um, and I'm sure she'll tell us something about that. Uh, the um, Samantha play here in our home last fall with the Chroma Players, which is a new group that was formed um, with Mary Ferrillo, who's now with the Boston Symphony, and Francesca McNeely. And uh, we're going to see more of them in the future. They made they became friends at Tanglewood, and it's going to be an ongoing pleasure to follow all of that. So. Um, please, everybody, welcome Samantha Bennett, um, Principal Second Violinist with the Sarasota Orchestra. Samantha? Thanks, Carl. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you so much for putting this program together. It was really an honor for me to be able to participate, and I'm really missing, as we all are, the Tanglewood Summers. I would be there normally right now and interacting with you guys um, and planning, I'm sure, our next house concert. So. This is a you know poor substitution, but you know what? I'll take it in these in these crazy times. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit um, today about really how Tanglewood has shaped my experience um, building a career um, in this new kind of classical world that we find ourselves in. And first of all, Carl mentioned yes, I'm principal second violinist of the Sarasota Orchestra, and I have held that role for the past four years now, and this would be my fifth season coming up. And I'm also, along with my husband, George Nixon, the co founder and artistic director of Ensemble New SRQ, which is a contemporary music collective based here in Sarasota. And we formed this group, um, as you will hear me explain, just from our desire to further the kind of music education and music programming that we had come to know and love, both in our schooling. Um, I went to New England Conservatory for my undergrad and master's, and George was with me at New England Conservatory for my undergrad, and he went to Juilliard for his master's. Um, and just the role that, te that contemporary music had in our lives um, has really shaped where we've ended up. Um, we find that it's important not only to be playing my well my first love personally is is orchestral music and that's why I'm so I feel very grateful to have um, secured a position where I can and really make that my career but what we noticed when we came to Sarasota the first time is that there wasn't the opportunity to continue um, the creation of new art um, to be really reflective of the times that we're in and for us to have more of a hands-on um, really um, you know a role that really takes our involvement to it from the forefront. Of course, the orchestra.
pastoral world is fantastic. And as a section leader, I do have quite a bit of say in the process of programming chamber music and um, various other aspects. But to have something that we really created with our own hands um, was really important. So before I kind of go into the genesis of, of all of that and how Tanglewood has really shaped um, my career at this point, I want to ask Ray to play the very first video, which I'd like to share with you. It's a piece by Aino Jahani Radhavara. And this is the first movement of that piece called Tanglewood. And I will explain a little bit more to you about that experience after Ray shows the video. Thank you. 
So that was the first movement of Aino, Jah Aino Jahani Radivara's um, Lost Landscapes. And I wanted to show this piece to you all because it re represents the direct line between my Tanglewood experience and education and what I created in Sarasota with Ensemble New SRQ. So first I'd like to just um, mention that I was very fortunate to benefit from the, my schooling actually at, at New England Conservatory. They had, and I believe that my undergrad years were some of the first um, years that they piloted a program and a class um, that was called Entrepreneurial Musicianship. And basically what the class was, was um, allowing people to think beyond traditional careers in classical music. So as of course we all know, there's, you know, you could be a soloist, you could be a chamber musician for a string player, usually that's a string quartet, or you could be an orchestral musician, or you could be a teacher, a university or, or a conservatory professor. And so what NEC was trying to do, and I think they um, had the, the sense to think kind of beyond what was currently the present dynamic and say, listen, there are a lot of other ways to craft a career in in music and we're going to try to give you this the tools to reach those goals so a lot of the class was about um you know kind of administrative work um forming your own 501c3 um all the kind of various other aspects of things that we don't really get taught um in our private lessons or other instruction so already when i came to tanglewood um and actually i was a fellow carl for three summers um 2011 2012 2013 2014, I was a From player, which I think um, most of you know is is a group of alumni from the TMC that are that are particularly um, suited to contemporary music performance. And I also was a From player in 2015. And um, the first time that I played this piece that you just heard was the culmination, or so I thought. I will explain more on that in a second of my time as a student at Tanglewood. Um, in the summer of 2015, I was asked to premiere the chamber orchestra version of that movement that you just heard. So um, it was incredibly exciting for me. Um, at the time, we were hoping that Radovar himself could make the journey, but he was quite old, 94, I believe, um, and was unable to make the premiere, but I got to play that movement that he had um, reorchestrated, especially for us, for with my TMC fellows in the string orchestra section, and then me playing the solo part. So, this was um, for me a really important kind of step in both my career as as a contemporary performer, and kind of gave me that real real inspiration to want to take this kind of music, um, which hopefully um, you experienced like I did. It's just beautiful, beautiful music and um, use it in a place where I thought we could, we could enhance the programming. So partly I have to also credit, of course, um, the Sarasota Orchestra because they allowed my position with, with them, not only was a dream come true for my other, you know, passion, orchestral music, and especially to be a leader of a violin section, um, but, they, in terms of their level of support for all of us in the orchestra, pursuing um, projects that further our musical d advancement, um, have supported us from the beginning. And so that performance that you just heard was from our very first season and at the very first concert, which we titled Lost Landscapes. And I actually went on to play the other four movements um, that Radovara has still, I don't, I don't believe orchestrated for, for chamber orchestra yet. Um, but that was the first tie over into the programming that we did in the ensemble that directly came from Tanglewood. And so um, I wanted to share that with you because it's really a, a testament to sort of how they really were with us from the beginning in terms of um, inspiring everything that we have since come to create with the ensemble. So that was from the first season. And what I'm gonna show next, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about before we play it. So the other thing about Tanglewood um, that, has, that I have benefited immensely from and continue to do so is just that it is this hot spot for attracting all of, and Carl mentioned this, all of the, the best talent from students to soloists, to guest conductors, to visiting artists, um, it is really, I, I, I consider it to be the center of the classical music scene. And to be able to 
be in that environment as a student, be in that environment as I'm moving as, well, of course, now I'm a professional, but as I was years ago moving into that professional world and to have these contacts where the thing about, the great thing about Tanglewood is that everyone's on the same playing field or so it feels to all of us who are there at the time. You know, you're interacting with people with huge names, you know, we're, we're getting conducted by John Williams. We get to hear a concert by Gil Shaham and, and Manny X. And we see those people backstage in, in Ozawa Hall. And, and there's something disarming about the, the environment of, of the Tangwood grounds that allows people to, to meet, artists to meet on this intellectual level that is really without pretension. And so um, as a result of this, I have formed relationships um, with people that I that I talk to today, and that have been critical in in all the music that I'm that I'm continuing to make. One of those people um, is Matthew O'Coin, who is a um, extremely now renowned um, composer and conductor. He had, I think, his first opera with commissioned by the Met premiered when he was like 26 or 27 years old, a, a few years ago by now. And actually, his was a funny story because. Um, he actually was a conducting seminar fellow and so had come to Tanglewood for two weeks to work with Stefan Asbury. And as a Fromm player, we are the ensemble that works with these, these conductors that come for the seminar. So they get up in front of this. Some of them have no experience conducting. Some of them have a great deal of experience conducting. And we as the Fromm players play orchestral reductions actually of Brahms and Beethoven symphonies and there's a pianist who fills out the wind parts and we get to experience these um, conductors composing for the first, uh, sorry, composers conducting for the first time. So I met Matt O'Coin in one of those um, excellent summers, I think it was 2013 I want to say. And um, so in terms of looking ahead for our ensemble season, we knew immediately that we wanted to feature him because um, he is somebody that is, has already kind of exploded onto the scene and will continue to do so and, and is really a genius. He actually last, I, the season that we performed his music, which I believe was 28, 2019, he had won a um, MacArthur Genius Grant for his, his work. Um, so we programmed a whole concert for the ensemble featuring his music and we invited him down to be a part of that concert, of course. Um, that sort of ties into the other great thing about contemporary music, which is that we are able to share with our audiences, the composers themselves, we are able to interact as musicians um, in rehearsal processes directly with that, the creator of the art that we are, are um, fulfilling and so that is something that cannot be replaced and of course as as wonderful as it is to play a work of Brahms or Beethoven the best that I can do is to is to hope that I can be an interpreter of that music in a way that's moving and meaningful for people in this modern world but when I work with a composer and conductor like Matt O'Coin, and as you will see a little bit later on in the program, Nina C. Young, I feel that I am um, a part of the creative process of bringing that, that, those works and that art to life from the beginning. And that, that's something that um, really, for me, is important because I am able to take ownership over the art in a way that otherwise I would not be able to. So this next piece that I'm going to show, just a, a snippet of, it's actually a longer work. Um, it's written by Matt, Matt O'Coin. It's called Its Own Accord. It's a violin and piano sonata. And fortunately, he was uh, available to play the piano part with me. Um, and we programmed that um, last season. And it's a longer work. It's three movements. Um, and it's about 20 minutes. So I'm only going to play the first little bit. I, wanna, I want you to hear... Um, sort of the, the the breadth of his style. The first movement is very short, um, so we'll st I'll stop. I'll have Ray stop the video a little bit uh, into the second movement, and um, it's it's a crazy piece and a little bit more. Um, it's a little bit more out there than the last one. So Ray, if you could cue up that second video for me, that would be wonderful.
thank you, Ray, for stopping that. There's no real good place to stop, but that was the best um, I could think of since it goes on for another 20 minutes. Um, so to that end, um, this is a piece that um, uses material that Matt has used previously in other works of his. It's, he uses some of this in some of his operas. And later on in that program that we, this concert was from, the performance that you just heard was from, we also played a, another piece of Matt's that involved counter tenor, solo violin, and a, and a large ensemble. And Matt is one of those people who I'd like to just kind of explain. So now that we're in a position where we have um, a season of five concerts throughout the year, and we're bringing in these artists that are now um, building a community relationship with the, the, the community of Sarasota. So not only does the orchestra kind of look to us in many ways in terms of um, you know, if they need someone who specializes in contemporary music for one of their um, soiree performances, we've actually recommended the pianist that we use for ourselves in the series, and the, and what, namely Connor Hannock. I'll just mention his name since he's such a great, um, great friend and great member of the ensemble. Um, so not only have we built relationships from composers and artists from Tanglewood, taking them with us to Sarasota. We've also now integrated them into the community um, at large there. Both the orchestra and, and our ensemble um, is sort of just better off from having this connection. And um, it's been so fruitful to see, to see how it's grown throughout the years. Um, I want to just move on now to someone who we are currently working with, um, Nina C. Young. She may be known to many of you. She's a New York-based composer, and um, we met her, I met her at Tanglewood um, in 2012 when she was a fellow there, a composition fellow, and we have gotten to know each other quite well over the years, and um, along with working with us, she also works with a group called Hub New Music. And Hub New Music is um, a quartet of clarinet, violin, cello, and flute. And the cellist in that quartet was my cellist in, at Tanglewood for two of my Fromm summers, Jesse Christensen. So when we wanted to do, again, I'm talking about kind of building, building community like outposts of all these, of, of all these artists that come to enrich the place that, that we, you know, know and love. So when we talked about with Jesse putting together a concert, we wanted to bring them down and feature them as um, at one of the concerts of our ensemble season. He has also, Jesse has played frequently with the Sarasota Orchestra. He's a regular sub um, in the cello section when he can make the time to come down here. Um, he was principal cello of the Mississippi, Mississippi Symphony um, for many years before starting his quartet. Um, when we wanted to feature them for a concert, one of the, the immediate first name of composer that we thought of was Nina C. Young. And um, she is someone who has really pushed the boundaries in terms of genre bending. She loves to do sort of jazz and mixed ensemble based programming. She's very into electronic music. Um, but the piece that you will hear is more traditional. And George is actually my husband and co-founder of Ensemble Nunes RQ um, is conducting this. Um, it's gonna take us into the last kind of bit of what I wanted to talk about, which is how do we move forward in now this time of, you know, no live music really in the same way that we have known for, for years and years and years. Um, when the whole pandemic kind of came upon us, um, we had a program that we were in the middle of with Sarasota Orchestra. It was actually with Keith Lockhart conducting Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra. We had played one concert and um, on Friday the 13th, which is unfortunately the date that everything got canceled for us, um, we had so we had that weekend of concerts that we um, were unable to perform. Not only the orchestra was canceled, of course, but the ensemble USRQ concert that we had coming up had to be postponed. So for us, um, we knew that we wanted to do something um, that kept us in the public view and kept advancing music and was able to connect with patrons and, and put some material out there. So we got in touch with Nina 
and we asked her if she would be willing to do a Zoom interview with us, and then we would follow up that Zoom interview with a performance that we had um, archived from uh, 2018, which was the, which is the piece that you're about to hear. It's called Rising Tide. Um, and not only was she super willing to do this, she was super excited because at that time, especially, you know, no one was really putting together any new content. So while, of course, the performance itself was archival, we were able to have um, a real interactive conversation with her and then broadcast that as well as part of this, this live stream. I should mention um, that Nina's piece, um, Rising Tide, fortunately, we have, since the beginning of uh, the ensemble, we have been recording all of our performances just for archival purposes, or so we thought. Um, we thought it was important from day one to have um, a video and audio record of everything that we had done so far. And I have to tell you, I've never been so thankful that we did that because that has allowed us, um, that has allowed me to share these performances with you. It's allowed me to, um, us to, you know, put content out there in otherwise a period of time where, you know, we're just unable to, you know, connect with, with audiences. So it's been really interesting the things that you, you think, oh, this would be a good idea to do. And then um, I'm very fortunate that we, that we did make those decisions because now um, we're able to share that. The other thing that is difficult with contemporary music and the orchestra doesn't really have this problem. They have a different set of problems in terms of releasing recordings, but of course um, the legality of, of sharing on a broad stage in a public way, um, you know, contemporary music is just different because you have to get permission from the publishers and composers who I must say all of them have been so willing to to do what they can to help the performers, such as myself, continue to maintain a pre presence um, during this time. So now I'd like to show you um, this, this next video. It's from two seasons ago with the ensemble. It's a piece by Nina C. Young, as I mentioned, and it features myself playing violin, my husband George uh, conducting, Connor Hannock, the pianist that I just mentioned, who is our number one pianist for the ensemble, and then members of Hub New Music, whom I met at Tanglewood, and who were my ch Jesse being the person who was um, the cellist in my two most formative from summers. Um, it's a beautiful piece, and I hope you enjoy. So, Ray, will you please cue up that third video for me?
Thanks, Ray. So I wanted to um, show you this whole performance and let it play through the whole thing because as it turns out, as I was putting this, this presentation together, I really felt like Nina's piece was sort of the culmination of both um, the representation of, of you know, what Tanglewood has meant to me, the relationships that, have, that I've formed there, how they've factored into my um, career, and also that this piece itself, titled Rising Tide, um, it sort of took on a new meaning after all of the pandemic um, changes hit our industry. And as you can kind of hear in the piece, everything comes together to a very violent climax um, where things kind of just halt and go like a, the paper is torn. And after that, you're left with um, this material that is kind of fluid and you don't know where it's going. And this is the period of time and musical creation that I find myself and so many of my colleagues find myself in right now. Um, so the question is, you know, where do we go from here? So I'll share with you a little bit um, about some projects that I have coming up and, and um, what I have seen. So one of them being a, a new piece written by Nina for George and myself, um, using only the percussion instruments that we have at our home, since we're not able to access um, our normal kind of wealth of, of instruments, which actually I should mention is quite a lot of instruments. So it's not gonna be too limited. Um, the second is um, a commission that the Chroma players, who Carl um, um, described a little bit at the beginning of the program, um, BSO violin, uh, violist Mary Ferrillo and um, fellow from alumni um, cellist Francesca McNeely. The four of us, I mentioned earlier that I thought that first performance was the culmination of my Tanglewood education but I actually was asked to return in the summer of 2017 um, as sort of a guest artist alumni from to the alumni. And I spent, I got to spend another amazing summer um, benefiting from um, great coachings and composers and other commissions. So Mary and Francesca were in my quartet in the summer of 2017. We decided that we wanted to further the um, repertoire for the string chord, uh, string trio, excuse me, um, where it's a little bit different than a quartet because you really feel like you're all three equal instruments. Um, so we've been doing some concerts now in addition um, to what I've, I've you know, shared with you as the Chroma players. And one of those, as Carl mentioned, was um, in his home in September. So that was so great to have that opportunity. So we are doing a commission as the Chroma players of a composer named Tyson J. Davis. Um, and it's going to be kind of experiencing and reflecting on this time. We had a great conversation with him the other day, and I think the title um, is going to be um, Intermittent Pauses. And what he kind of wanted to get at with this was we were all working towards something artistically, and now we had to take a break. And now where do we go from here? So it's the same kind of idea. So artists are really taking um, the, the experience of today and kind of hoping to um, put it to good use. So that commission will be finished in March of 2021. And, you know, on, on the plus side, all of these new things are coming about. But on the other hand, there were projects, of course, that, that um, got canceled or pushed back. Um, because of this. And one of those, um, which was also going to be um, another representation of how connected I've been with, with the Boston Symphony and with, and with Tanglewood in general, and it was going to be with Francesca and Mary, um, was going to be actually something that we were doing this summer, which is a collaboration with the BBC Radio Symphony. And we were asked to perform a program, a quartet pro program of American music. So that program would have featured um, Elliot Carter's first string quartet, a Ruth Crawford Seeger string quartet, um, a, the Auguste Reed Thomas uh, octet for percussion quartet and string quartet, which was premiered last summer um, at the opening of the Tanglewood Learning Institute. And um, there's one more I'm missing. What am I missing? Oh, a Ravel string quartet, which was actually um, the one non-American work on that program. We were going to be workshopping that this summer at Tanglewood. We would have been there um, right now um, doing an informal performance at the TLI. And then um, the plan was to have a concert at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. 
and then to take that program to the Barbican in London in December. So hopefully that program has only been postponed one year. So we will resume our work on that um, next year and kind of follow that same trajectory. But it's been difficult to adjust because, you know, these are pieces that we've been working on. So finally, I would like to just share with you um, one more video. And that video is sort of the culmination of this new way of making art during this crazy time. And um, it ties us all together. This was, this is a piece by the percussionist, the principal percussionist of the Phoenix Symphony, who is also a um, established composer. And he has a kind of more contemporary style, sorry, contemporary is the wrong word to use, um, popular music style. Um, it's a little bit more jazzy and, and electronic. And um, what you will see is actually a video that we recorded in our home in Sarasota. And at the time, BSO percussionist and fellow friend to the Schusters, um, Kyle Brightwell, and his wife, Micah, were actually quarantining with us for three months in Florida before Florida turned around and now Florida is way worse than Boston and vice versa. They were with us um, during this whole crazy time, which was actually really wonderful because we got to play music together in a setting that we normally would never have had the time or opportunity to do. So Sean wrote a trio for members of Ensemble New SRQ, namely myself and George and, and Kyle Brightwell of the BSO. And it's called Laughing Buddha. And um, you will see in it just the, the way that we've had to respond. It's much more lo-fi than anything that you've seen. Of course, it was recorded on our iPhones and our iPads in our house. And we sent the files to Sean, the composer. Um, went back and forth a couple times with um, different adjustments he wanted to make. And he put it together um, into what you will see. And, and I'm hopeful that this, this shows a glimmer of hope for our industry and that, you know, you can kind of throw, throw us these obstacles, but people are always going to have something to say. And um, there are those of us who will want to do the saying of, of the, the ideas and concepts that um, move them. And I think I've taken solace in that fact because I, I know that through that energy and collaboration that we will find a way forward through this pandemic time. And I'm looking forward to, you know, sort of resuming um, everything beyond this. But in the meantime, we are still creating and we are still um, making music and making art. And um, I'm so grateful to have had all of the experiences of my time as a student, as a professional, um, especially at Tanglewood, um, to shape, you know, what I'm doing to move forward through this. So without further ado, um, I would like to ask Ray to play the final video, which is a quarantine commission by Ensemble Nis New SRQ um, of Sean Tilburg's Laughing Buddha.
Thank you, Ray. So um, with that, I think my, the bulk of my presentation is now concluded. I, I wanted to say one thing about um, Sarasota Orchestra, and I think Carl sent you all the video that we put together of the Beethoven 7 virtual performance. Um, you know, that's another example of the sort of technical possibilities, but also limitations that we have. And that was extremely difficult to put together um, because, you know, we all had only the metronome click to play to play from. We didn't get to hear everybody else playing. And then it was assembled um, post-production, if you will, um, to everyone playing together. So little things like this we're all adjusting to in our profession. And and hoping to find a way forward. So thank you so much for um, listening. And um, Carl, if, if there are any questions, um, I can definitely answer them. Fabulous. You know, we have um, uh, Louise Frankenberg has entered a, a statement really of love this last piece, not normally a, a fan of new music. And I just want to say that what I have found over the years um, is that new music in the hands of the younger players who are really competent with it, like Samantha is, is an altogether different experience than perhaps sometimes with the older players who really didn't grow up with it and don't quite have the ear for it. Um, it, it, it isn't always as good a result and as interesting to listen to. So I thought Sam, you might want to comment on, on that, whether you agree or disagree. Yeah, I definitely agree, Carl. And, and that's something that, that we've found this generation, you know, it's, it speaks to us in a different way. And also the, the trend of new music, um, and by that, I mean, the kinds of compositions that are being written, as you heard today, you know, it, they really span kind of all genres. Like the last piece had some funk in it, had some reggae almost, um, so, you know, versus the new music that you thought of maybe in the 60s, 70s, when things had really come to a totally dismantled point where there's no tonality and everything's thrown out the window, it's pointillistic, it's minimal, it's um, a very academic, um, we've moved away from that now into this, this new wave of, of what's being created today. And I think, I think you're right in terms of our generation, because I think because we've had to find a way to keep classical music relevant, um, have really found a, a new passion on as a whole, I think. Many, many more of the, the players of my generation are, are, you know, interested in this music and, and um, able to do more with it, I think, in some ways, not to knock anybody, you know, from any of the older generation of musicians. But yeah, we do have, I think, more of a fun approach to it as well. So, you know, we, feel joy in playing it and and therefore the audience you know feels that joy a little bit more too it's that's kind of a segue into a little pitch for the next remaining two concerts that we're doing peter dugan who's coming up next week the pianist um uh, i had emailed him about perhaps talking a little bit about being a crossover musician and he uh, took exception to the use of the word crossover because he intends to talk to us a little bit about all music and it's all organic for him. He doesn't feel like he's a crossover musician. He feels like he's a musician and everything counts. And that's a wonderful attitude, I think. And then our last um, session is with Ashley Bathgate, the cellist who does almost all contemporary music, although she's a wonderful interpreter of Bach. And I always say about Ashley that in her hands, new music is really special. Uh, it, and and um, everybody who tunes in will see a, a, an absolute master at using the cello in ways that I've never heard used before, but it's very convincing and very beautiful and uh, very adventuresome. I, I really find it very interesting. So, um, so I have a question for you, Samantha. Um, how does it affect your playing as a violinist that you're married to a, to a percussionist? How does, that, <laughs> how does that all work out? You, you know, it's interesting. Um, uh, I, first, uh, first of all, I think that, you know, I'm thankful that we don't play the same instrument. I don't understand how couples who, you know, do the same exact thing, make it work. Now I think violin and percussion actually works out quite well together because they're so different. And, um, you know, we both have our own 
role in the orchestra and our own voice so we're never like kind of competing in that way we, we actually are are just great collaborators um i have to say it has helped my rhythm very much so especially in new music you know as i've as I think about, you know, what my concept of good rhythm was um, 10 years ago, it's just not the same. And George has really helped. And just being around percussion and listening to them practice and, and prepare for auditions, it, it instills in you a different kind of importance because for them, you know, that's their number one um, element to the musical process is rhythm. And sometimes, especially as a string player, you know, um, string teaching doesn't necessarily always put the emphasis on on that as much as they do on, you know, interpretation and sound color and vibrato. And so I think the best violinists and the best string players are those who have this sense of good rhythm. And I'm grateful to have been able to hone it um, through George and I's collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. I have, to, I have to also say about George, for those who may not know, he's an awfully accomplished percussionist and um, has been with the Dallas Orchestra for what, about a year or so? And yeah, he just did his first season with them as principal yeah. percussion. And um, he was at Tanglewood last summer playing in the percussion se section in, uh, in the shed. And, um, and I can vouch for the fact that he's a fabulous instructor of music history because we've yeah. attended some of his lectures and he could, be, he could put down his instrument tomorrow and he could be a professor of history, of music history. He's fabulous. So one last question. Um, Stuart Levy has asked, a lovely exposure to music interests of younger artists Question on lifestyle. With your husband in an endowed chair in Dallas, you in Sarasota, and all of the traveling gigs, can you give us an idea of the lifestyle of a two-career family? Yes. Well, um, I will say that um, the answer I would have given you five months ago is incredibly different from the answer I'm giving you today um, because of, of course, the, the situation. But um, yeah, it's it's difficult in terms of the amount of travel that we do back and forth and just the, the variety of different projects that we have on the table at once. And so, um, you know, up until everything stopped in March this year, it was quite busy. I mean, we were going back and forth pretty much every two weeks, either one or the other. And sometimes it ended up being, you know, every week, you know, I'd, I'd either wouldn't go to Dallas for two weeks, but in that interim period, he would come to Sarasota um, in the meantime. I will say, so this works out to our advantage that for percussion, they're not required for every program. So whenever the orchestra is doing, in Dallas is doing, you know, an all Brahms program or Beethoven or smaller string works, he has that time off. So he's able to come back to Sarasota. Um, and then of course he has, when he signed with them, he, they knew about his role as, as, as artistic director of Ensemble New SRQ and we had the schedule lined up. So they were um, allowing of, of that opportunity for him to continue um, his role with the ensemble. So it was already predetermined that he would come back for the, the season of concerts um, for the ensemble. Um, so, so it's worked out um, as well as I think it, it can, and I hope it continues. Now, it was very nice in some, in many ways that in March, um, everything kind of stopped because that meant that George was actually back in Sarasota for that whole, the whole rest of the year. Um, and so that was great just to, um, you know, have that time again together to, to make music, et cetera. So um, yeah, it's just kind of the way that things go, I think for many of us in this profession and, and um, we'll see how it all, you know, how, how it all turns out. We all miss live music so much, especially here in the Berkshires to drive by Tanglewood almost every day and it's quiet and peaceful, very, still very beautiful, but it's quiet. Uh, we're all looking forward to the day when we can be back in the, in the concert hall. And, um, and I'm looking for, the only thing that would be better than today, what, the session that you did for us, would be if you were live with the Chroma players in our living room. So, I know. Well, well, we'll have to look forward to it. Yeah, for sure. So thank you so much, Samantha. It was just fabulous. Um, we hope everybody has a good day. And don't forget, um, Andrews Nelson is conducting Mahler 3 by streaming at 2.30 on the um, 
BSO uh, streaming path. So uh, those of you who might be interested, that's coming right up. So take care. Enjoy your afternoons. Thank you, Samantha. Bye-bye. Thank you, Carl.